Uh, thank you to those who are joining us this evening. We will begin shortly. Um, we are just waiting for all attendees to make their way into the main Zoom space. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Um, we are just uh, waiting for all attendees to make their way into the main Zoom space and we will begin shortly. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jeremy Hughes, and I'm the Communications Coordinator here at the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy. Um, before I introduce you to tonight's guests, just a couple of points of, of housekeeping. This event is being professionally live human captioning, so you can turn that on using the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, additionally, there is a stream text link available for this, so you can, that is a fully adjustable version of the transcript that will be available in your browser. So the link to that will appear shortly in the chat um, and you'll be able to open that and, and see that there. Um, a transcript will also be made of the event, so alongside the recording, you'll be able to view that online too. Um, before we begin, some other points. Uh, this event will be recorded on Zoom, as I just mentioned, so um, by attending you are giving your consent to, to be filmed and be on this platform. Um, the recording will be available on both the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy websites and the CRASH websites. Um, our guests tonight will speak for around 30 minutes and then there'll be the opportunity for audience to ask Q&A. Um, please can we ask that you use the Q&A function that's specific on Zoom to do that um, as the chat won't be monitored for Q&A um, all the time. So yeah, the Q&A button if that's all right. And yeah, please follow us and tag us on Twitter and other social media platforms. Um, our hashtag, our, sorry, our account handle is at MCTD Cambridge. Um, and so you can find us there and we will also drop the links for those in the chat too. Um, tonight I'm joined by two guests, uh, one from our team here, which is Yulia Rone um, and James Muldoon. Um, Yulia Rone is a research associate here at the Mindaroo Centre for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge. And she has spent the last decade uh, researching politics and utopias and dystopias um, of digital media. Uh, Yulia holds a PhD in social and political science uh, for the European Uni uh, University Institute in Florence and an MSc degree from the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, we are now pleased this evening that Yulia is joined by James Muldoon um, and I'll now hand over to Yulia who will introduce James. Hi Yulia. Hello everyone. Um, I am now going to present James and uh, talk very briefly about his book before giving the floor to him. Uh, James Muldoon is a senior lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter and head of digital research at the Autonomy Think Tank. In 2020, he published Building Power to Change the World, in which he explored the political thought of the German council movements that basically brought down the German monarchy, founded several short-lived council republics and dramatically transformed European politics. 
in his own words. In his latest book, the one we are going to talk about today, Platform Socialism, published by Pluto Press, uh, James Muldoon set out an alternative vision and very concrete proposals for a digital economy that expands our freedom. And I'm very excited to present this book. I read it over the Christmas and New Year break, surrounded by uh, five children. The original story, there were nine, but a good friend of mine told me not to exaggerate. So the accurate number was five very sweet and very loud children. But yeah, I was completely immersed in this book and it became kind of my New Year resolution. So without exaggeration, I really think it's one of the best and most daring books I've read in the last years, actually. And I'm going to mention three things that I find really great about the book, and then I'm going to give the floor to James. And I, of course, as a critical academic, have also some comments and questions, but we'll leave this for the discussion. But yeah, I think this book is fantastic because it basically addresses the two biggest problems of the contemporary academic life. First, we are absolutely amazing at criticizing and at finding what's wrong with the current situation, but we are much worse at proposing alternatives and saying what should be done. And I think James's book is a very good example of this kind of more speculative political science and theory, uh, in the sense that it really proposes very concrete um, ideas of how things can be changed. And this is, of course, I think a broader recent trend, uh, a very good example uh, I can share from the pandemic times uh, in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Cambridge, there are essay questions that students should choose from. And I remember that in the middle of the pandemic, the most popular questions were uh, questions on utopia. So there is clearly a change, I think, in spirit with people really desperately needing some better visions of the future. And the book by James basically proposes this. And second, something that I already mentioned, it's very concrete and specific. Again, we are tired of people criticizing neoliberalism or capitalism, all these very broad words, uh, but offering uh, very vague ideas of what will come afterwards. Uh, James's book is extremely concrete, very specific, very rich, and I think this really sets it apart from many other studies that I have encountered and attempts at speculative uh, fiction or theory. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic book that really outlines um, these kinds of radical reforms, as my colleague um, Linus Beshoiser from uh, Berlin uh, has outlined, he works on this, also actually working on with British political theory. And the good thing about these reforms, that radical reforms that James suggests are that they are radical, they are system changing, but they're also falsifiable in the sense of you can see whether they work or they not. And if they don't, we can think of some other alternatives. So it's both an ambitious utopian, but actually realistic utopian book. And it is a very specific and rich book. Um, and the third thing that I really like about it is the fact that I think it's very deep. I know this sounds usually ironic when we say it, but I think in this case, it is actually true. It's a book that draws on a very rich socialist tradition. And this is why I also wanted to mention the first book. Um, it draws on the work of um, George Coe and uh, guild socialism, of Otto Neurath and the idea of socialization of economy. So these brilliant, but quite often forgotten thinkers. And so it's a book that thinks about the future, but is very deeply rooted in the past and in often forgotten good ideas. Uh, beyond the failures of real existing socialism. And I like this a lot. It reminds me a, a lot of current trends also in Eastern Europe, of, of people trying to go before 45 and recover socialist roots and traditions that have been forgotten indeed. So yeah, it's a fantastic book. I recommend everyone to read it. Now I give the floor to James and then I'll ask him my critical uh, questions afterwards. James, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm just going to put a link to the book in the chat. Um, let me also put in my little code. You can get 30% off the book if you use that. It's a little, um, a little gift from me to the world. Um, so today I will share my screen with you, first of all, and then I will be discussing some ideas from my book that was published this year, Platform Socialism. The book is really about imagining a different way we can organize the internet, ways in which we can take over software, take over the platforms and have them run by communities themselves. So the book um, came out in January and it's been really wonderful sharing these ideas with people and also hearing about so many resonances with other people's projects. 
Um, and, you know, fortunately for me, the big tech companies continue to, to destroy the world and to have these amazing, uh, almost cartoonish super villainy like episodes with Facebook becoming meta and now Elon Musk buying Twitter. Um, and as of today, it's just really fascinating to see that four of the biggest communication platforms in the world are owned essentially uh, and controlled by two, two men, right? Mark Zuckerberg and, and Elon Musk. And it's really just a, a, an interesting and a, a deeply troubling turn of events um, that so much of our political debate, so much of how we communicate with each other um, is really subject to the arbitrary power um, and the whims of, of these billionaires. So what is big tech's um, ambition for the world? What kind of a world um, does big tech want us to be living in in 10 years' time or 20 years' time? I think it's important to see that what we see now with Facebook's turn to meta and this construction of these series of kind of hybrid online, offline worlds um, is a series of interconnected products and services that big tech will be hoping um, infiltrates almost every aspect of our daily lives, um, from our messaging services to our shopping to our connection with friends and family. The idea is that everything would be connected um, in as part of a, a broader ecosystem of products and that through things like subscription services, through monetizing transactions, through monetizing uh, you know, the way in which we trade and, and, and connect with other people, that tech companies will be able to seamlessly take profit from us as we go through the system. That we might you know, pay 20 pounds, $20 a month for, for such and such service. We would go onto a gaming platform and we might want to buy a new avatar or a skin. We might be able to trade those across different platforms. Um, we can really see that the ambition of these companies is to create new digital worlds where we'll be spending an increasingly uh, large amount of our time. Uh, it will be both for work, for, for friends, for entertainment. Um, and this will be a space that will be fully monetized and fully owned by corporations. Um, so this is a very troubling kind of turn of events that's happened over the past couple of years. And we can look at things like Microsoft's recent acquisition of, of Activision, um, the kind of hybrid social media gaming space, starting to see more connections, um, the growth of pay to earn, sorry, play to earn gaming, where you can actually earn money and, and kind of almost have a career uh, being part of games, both developing games and playing them. Um, there's a lot that's going on, right? Um, now, over the past five years during the so-called tech clash, more and more people have turned against technology, right? They've seen technology and tech companies as part of the problem, but it's hard to agree on what the precise nature of the problem is, right? Some people are concerned about social media addiction, others with hate speech and misinformation. Um, and depending on your political persuasion, uh, you'll have a different diagnosis of the problem. Now, I want to briefly talk about two of those today, um, which I call the humanist critique and the antitrust critique, and to talk about how I come from a slightly different perspective that I think sheds a different light on the situation. So the first group of critics that I talk about, oh, no, I need to go backwards. The first group of critics I talk about are the tech humanists. These are the people like um, Shoshana Zuboff, um, the Netflix show, The Social Dilemma that you might've seen, um, uh, Jaron Lanier, people who say that our autonomy as thinking and, and feeling human beings is undermined by the way in which social media hijacks our attention. We get push notifications, we get nudges. Um, it, you know, through a deep understanding of social psychology, tech companies have been able to uh, circumvent our rational autonomous decision-making processes, leading us to, to a kind of inhuman form of interaction with social media. Now, I think there's a, certainly a point to this and um, uh, it, it diagnoses a certain aspect of the problem, but the solutions tend to um, gravitate more towards personal um, consumer choices, right? That we should just switch off social media that tech CEOs should just be more ethical in how they deploy technology. 
what I think it ignores a little bit is the underlying political economy of data markets and the structural incentives that the companies face when they're operating in these markets. Um, you know, Facebook is is doesn't have a particularly unethical CEO. There's no suggestion that uh, another individual in in Mark Zuckerberg's place would necessarily be able to do anything different. And this is because the company is beholden to its shareholders. Um, and it has to increase profits. And the way it increases profits in as an advertising platform is to increase user engagement, uh, to get people to spend more time on the platform. Uh, and part of that in a social media space is, is by having more engaging, sometimes provocative, sometimes extreme content. Um, so the, the question uh, of the underlying political economy is really central to this. Now, a second set of critics um, I have much more sympathy for um, people who are championing this new antitrust or anti-monopoly agenda. Um, it's very big in both the US and Europe. Um, you would have seen it on Elizabeth Warren's um, presidential campaign. Now they're calling for big tech companies to be broken up. Now they also have a really good point, which is big tech companies are now too big. They're too powerful. They exercise enormous gatekeeping power over um, marketplaces and incredible power over public debate and public discourse as well, as we've seen recently with Twitter and, and Musk. Um, so there is a huge point here. I, I'm a big fan uh, of some aspects of this movement. I agree with the part of the diagnosis. I do think um, some of these big tech companies are too big and too powerful. Um, the issue comes to the remedies as well. Sometimes uh, it's, it's claimed that we could break up some of these social media companies into a dozen or so smaller companies, um, such as what happened to big oil in the early 20th century and to the telecommunications companies in the 1980s. The issue, one, there's one practical issue here, which is I don't think the affordances of, of, of social media and um, tech platforms really allow for something like this to happen, practically speaking. It, doesn't, it wouldn't provide consumers... Uh, and users of the platform with any advantages to have like a Midwest Facebook, a Pacific Facebook, an Asian Facebook. Um, the whole point of a social media is to have an international audience where you can connect with your friends and family. So there's a real practical question there as to what the companies would be doing um, and whether that would actually be uh, provide any benefit. The second issue here is that because of the structural incentives that these companies face, um, if we were to break up companies or in some way, let's, let's put a different option on the table. Let's say they have to have a market capitalization below a certain amount. Maybe they have to have a certain user base below a certain amount after which they get taxed at an incredible rate or something like that. Now, because of the political economy of data markets, there's nothing to suggest that like 10 or 20 smaller companies would behave any differently to the, the one giant monopoly company. Because again, it's about user engagement. It's about generating profits. Um, and so we face a certain problem here that so long as you have these private platforms um, that make money essentially off user engagement through advertising, um, there's going to be these um, systemic constraints over what you can actually do in the system. So the question I put forward then is, you know, is it right that some of the largest communication infrastructure that we operate and that we need today is privately owned, is subject to be, you know, scooped up by whichever billionaire feels the need on that particular day, um, should they be assets that are, are traded on, on an open market? Um, and do we need to start talking more about these fundamental underlying questions of, of power, of ownership and control? Um, and so part of the, the project of platform socialism and the book is about thinking about how we can turn our mind to these so that we're not just talking about how to fix Facebook, how to regulate it, um, what kinds of constraints we might put on, on Zuckerberg and co, but rather thinking of alternatives. What kinds of other systems do we have? What is available today? What could we build? What could we develop? What prototypes do we have? Um, and how can they be seen as part of maybe an interconnected whole? So this is really the problem that I turn to uh, in the book. Now, very briefly, I just want to talk about um, how I understand digital platforms, what I think the fundamental problems are, 
um, and therefore how what solutions we might want to look at. Um, so I define digital platforms in the book essentially as value capture devices, right? The difference between a platform business and, and a, an ordinary business is that platforms and platform owners aren't necessarily doing any of the work. They're there to capture the value that's created by other people, either through acting as middlemen, um, as gatekeepers, um, or finding ways to benefit from the actions of others, right? That might be through an advertising model. It might be through a subscription model. Um, and there's a couple of different aspects of this. The first, I think, is that we can see um, some people use the word feudalism, but I think that, I mean, it's still capitalism, right? I think the a more accurate description is probably rentier relations, rentier capitalism, um, as uh, Brett Christophers puts it. Um, and here we can see that the, the platforms are acting as intermediaries, right? They're generating revenue through connecting party. Now, this might be on a labor platform. Um, it might be on Airbnb or, or Uber where people are, tra uh, are connecting parties that want to buy and sell or want to, you know, rent a house or, or, or have a holiday. But essentially the platform is, is benefiting from having and owning rather than doing, right? That they set up the conditions where there's an entire marketplace that, that occurs on their platform that takes place that they can just skim a little bit off every transaction. And the idea is that you buy up competitors, you get rid of your competitors so that you have a near monopoly and then you can, you can charge monopoly prices. So this is one aspect of it. The second is... When it comes to digital platforms uh, in, in today's kind of platform capitalism, there's a real uh, concentration of profits. We can see that, you know, the, the shareholding of these companies and the, the market capitalization is kind of five, top five uh, companies are, are mainly tech companies with, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and they're, but at the same time, they're dispersing risk and responsibility. None of the platforms want to own anything, right? They don't want to own the houses. They don't want to own the cars. And they certainly don't want to employ a permanent labor force. So we've got this huge rise of uh, independent contractors. Um, we've got the rise of, you know, risk uh, of undertaking work being, being pushed back onto workers. They don't get holiday pay. They don't get sick pay. They can't contest decisions that are happening on the platform because they're algorithmically managed. Um, and this is kind of bleeding out into other parts of the economy now as well. Um, the third aspect of platforms is that they generate network effects, and this leads to monopoly conditions. The more users you have, the more data you'll have, the better the service will be, the more money you'll have. Um, and because of how quickly a platform can scale and how quickly it can become dominant in a space and how hard it is then to dislodge um, that, that kind of corporation, it's very easy to dominate markets. And this leads to some of the aspects or some of the problems that we're seeing with digital um, platforms. So taking these um, problems as they are, we can also see that there's a really big issue going on with big tech's marketing and PR campaigns. And this is something that I bring up in the book because it's not just that they're selling themselves as more efficient businesses, as leaner businesses, as places where you, shareholders will make you know, greater profits. They're also selling themselves, and we've seen this with Elon Musk today, as you know, solving the world's problems, as connecting global community. And I call this in the book, you know, community washing big tech. It's a way of using this PR strategy and this kind of tech for good mindset um, to frame the activities of their company in a much more positive community empowerment kind of light. And I think the great irony of this for many of these tech companies is that it's almost in complete opposition to the very extractive business models that they run um, that are really designed to take as much money and as much value from people as possible, right? Most of them are not selling a super valuable service. They're finding ways in which they can set themselves up essentially to extract money from people. Now, if it's Facebook or Google, it's just through this data mining operation of selling valuable consumer insights to people without remunerating the users themselves at all, right? So it's a kind of privatizing a digital commons. Um, for other companies, it's either through sub, uh, charging transaction fees, uh, through trying to find ways to, to get between people to 
overtake functions that that public you know administrators used to perform that other industries used to perform and you can see a very long history of companies like airbnb now meta uh sorry uh, facebook now meta and airbnb slowly learning these lessons in the 2010s and and gradually rebranding themselves as global community builders of engaging in these kind of faux community organizing tactics of trying to get their user base to to, to act as like empowered community members against local legislators and it's really in complete contrast uh, to the very extractive way in which they approach real world communities, so communities that they rely on. So what's the alternative then? Oh, I say here's, here's a few of their, um, you know, PR and marketing about their community building. So what's the alternative then? Well, in the book, I try to name uh, platform socialism as a, an overarching strategy that we, we might want to talk about to think about alternatives to some of these big corporate platforms. Specifically, I think we need to think about this underlying ownership model. So I think some form of social ownership of the digital assets and some form of democratic control when we talk about governance um, over these systems is what really matters, right? So it's not enough to have like an ethical alternative. It's not enough to have like a cool guy that wears a t-shirt as the CEO. Um, it's not enough to have diversity on the board of directors. All of those things might be good in and of themselves, but I think we need much more than that. So platform socialism is about new forms of participatory and decentralized governance. Um, so I look at a variety of alternative ownership models, different ways in which communities, big and small, can own and operate platforms together. Um, I also introduce this new term, um, because I think it facilitates holistic thinking about systemic alternatives, right? I think you can't have platform socialism without a more thoroughgoing socialism. Uh, and I think it helps unite a series of divergent complaints that people have about tech companies around a common goal of having greater community control, um, greater uh, ownership over, over what's happening. Um, I think this is, you know, very important part of it. Um, and so really the centerpiece of this project is thinking, is unpacking what we mean by social ownership here. Um, you could say democratic ownership, you could say uh, public ownership. Let me explain why I didn't use either of those terms. Um, one reason why I think we need to think about social ownership is that it's not always going to be the level of the state uh, at which these platforms are going to be owned. I think you need a variety of different models, different sizes of community. So drawing on the work of a, of a, a early socialist theorist called GDH Cole, um, I talk about the need to look at the function the platform performs um, and the size of the community that uses it to determine how it might be owned and operated. So there are a variety of different platforms that would work very well at a local level. I don't think we need state ownership of everything. I do, certainly don't think we need global behemoth corporations to run the same kind of service in every city. There are a whole variety of things that are platform mediated today. Things like domestic cleaning, freelance work, you know, food delivery, things that happen between people on a local level within one suburb or within one city. Um, these kinds of things could actually be run quite functionally by a workers' cooperative, uh, an organization where the workers collectively own the, the um, organization and the tools that they use, um, and that they enjoy the full fruits of their labor, right? So they're all equal members, they're equal um, cooperative operators of these platforms. And we actually see a, a small but growing movement of platform cooperatives um, that is internationally organized today. They've got a kind of center with Trevor Schultz in New York. Um, and there's some interesting things happening in that space. Um, but I don't think workers cooperative should be the limit of our imagination when it comes to new forms of digital platforms. Some kinds of digital infrastructure, data centers, um, uh, assets that are required are too large and too expensive to be run efficiently by workers cooperative, right? And they're also perhaps too important. When it comes to things like transport, 
um, like housing, some of these services might be better run by a municipal government, could be at the level of the city, um, could be the level of kind of a, a large uh, section of a city. Um, and we can imagine things like, you know, Muni B&B, an Airbnb run by a municipality where things like um, over-touristification, of gentrification, of housing being taken off the long-term housing market and, and used as a commodity and a, as an asset on the short-term housing market, those kinds of issues might be dealt with more productively by someone with regulatory power to, you know, to tell um an organization how long they can actually have their house on a short-term market for um, and it might be dealt with more effectively by organizations that actually run the other transport or housing options in that city so i think we can look profitably to the municipal level for a whole host of really exciting experiments with digital platforms and digital democracy today most notably of course would be barcelona with things like the descent pilot and the decode pilot more recently um, their old um, chief technology officer francesca bria has done some really interesting stuff um, in that space along with her team and many others as well um, it's not just, uh, but this shouldn't stop at the level of the city, right? I think there are many platforms that could, you know, be run very well at the level of the state, particularly when it comes to things like social welfare and social security. The NHS has one of the largest data troves of, you know, in the United Kingdom, for example, um, when it comes to things like healthcare and, and, and unemployment benefits and things like that, we can imagine national or state level platforms um, as well as like, you know, digital ID systems and, and things like that. Um, now, I think the most challenging stage and one that I think is, is, you know, deeply necessary is also the international level. And the trick here is that we don't even have a, a kind of partially functioning democratic system on the international realm um, as, as we do in the national one. So it's very hard to imagine what an international democratic structure of governance would be like. Um, but with digital platforms, we are, you know, closer than ever before um, to actually putting this into practice, right? To, to have ways in which we can vote online on, on proposals, that we can have deliberative fora, um, that all of these, you know, practical limitations that, that prevented many, you know, former international experiments in democracy from functioning um, uh, are, are much easier to deal with today. Now, into the international level is also very, you know, very important because of the issue of digital colonialism. We can't talk meaningfully about nationalizing Google or, or Amazon or any of the big American tech companies without contemplating how um, unfair and unjust that would be on the, the billions of users outside of America um, that use these platforms that would honestly have no say in how they operated if these were, you know, suddenly put in the hands of, of American politicians and lawyers. Um, so there's a real need to think about at, from the local to the international about the structures of governance that would allow users of the platforms to have a, a, a profitable say um, in, in how they're actually structured, how they run. And then, you know, new tools that are available, so platforms like Decidim, um, or Liquid Democracy, um, other, you know, tools that allow us to be able to talk with each other, to have voting. Um, we need to start thinking about how these can be put into practice uh, to think more about what the structure of governance would look like at some of these platforms. Let me give you, this is all, um, you know, quite theory based. So let me give you some practical examples. Here's a local platform cooperative that um, uh, that I work with in in Islington in in um, well it's Jeremy Corbyn's constituency so love him or hate him here he is repping wings um, you know you had a you had a rough run in 2019 so I I, I campaigned for Jeremy but he uh, it was look it was it was a pretty pretty tough campaign wasn't it but here's his Rich Mason with um, the who's the one of the organizers of Wings. Um, and what's great about Wings is it's a practical alternative to Deliveroo for Northern Londoners um, that runs as a, a platform cooperative. So all members share equally in the, the profits of the company. Um, it's ethical, it's run only by push bikes, so it's environmentally friendly. They have better relationships with restaurants. They charge restaurants much lower fees because they're not looking to, to turn a massive profit from this. 
um, and they've just started up. And another really interesting thing about Wings is it's an example of a collaboration between a workers' cooperative and a municipal government because Islington Council actually has partially funded them um, and helped them get off the ground and also provides them with resources and tools. And this kind of partnership and this construction of, of a cooperative ecosystem is a really important point of getting more of these cooperative business models off the ground. Um, because, you know, one of the main lessons of cooperatives is that they do need a, a very flourishing cooperative uh, environment in which they can, they can prosper. So that's one example. Another example in the um, short-term housing market is this organization called fairbnb.coop. Um, now, this is a, a kind of Airbnb clone, if you will. They offer short-term rental services, but it's a very different model. Um, the truth of Airbnb and other short-term rental platforms at the moment is that they're, they're businesses within businesses. You know, Airbnb paints itself as this, you know, mum and pop operation of allowing middle-class micro entrepreneurs to rent out their spare room. But the, the reality of the platform is that over 50% of the listings are by professional Airbnb businesses, basically people who own three to a hundred properties uh, and who have taken them off the long-term market and basically have turned them into commodities. Um, Fairbnb runs a one house, one host policy. So thinking about how you can reduce that commodification of housing, and they also charge a much lower fee. They just charge 15% enough to maintain the platform. And half of this fee actually goes back to community projects that are, are chosen by the hosts. Um, one really interesting thing I love about Fairbnb is that they're trying to move towards a multi-stakeholder model of governance. So the idea is that um, groups of hosts within a city will be able to establish their own nodes and um, come up with the rules that, that would have to be abided by by guests coming in to their city. So this might include things like, you know, paying a tourist fee to the municipal government. It might be a particular rule around how many nights hosts can actually rent out houses to protect against over-touristification. Um, could be a whole variety of things, right? But it's kind of shaped in this federal network where you can have people coming on to the same platform using the same software, but it generating different rules depending on where you want to stay. And that that could in a way be decided at a more local level that allows you to have this federation of um, cooperative alternatives, um, but you know, allowing autonomy within that as well. Here's another example of um, turning to the like the sphere of transport and ride hail. Um, this is something that I know people have toyed with before, um, but it's just it's well, it's partly it's incredibly expensive and partly it would come up against the black cab um, uh, legacy, and and that's kind of a very difficult. Uh, um, advocacy organization to, to, to go up against. I don't think Sadiq Khan has any um, appetite for that. But um, politics aside, we can think about what a municipally owned ride hail platform might look like. And I live in London, so I've kind of given that as the example. Um, in London, it would be administered by an organization called TFL that run all the, the kind of trains and, and underground and overground here. Um, and there are many advantages for thinking about why a ride hail service would work particularly well when integrated into other public transport options. Um, it could share in the data of the other network. It would kind of be able to match the network effects of other large corporate um, entities. Um, but it could also enable the um, public transport organization to nudge people away from single car transportation. You know, if it, it for some people, it's just a habit that they want to go somewhere, they'll get their little Uber app and they'll look, you know, how to get there. If you did that and you, you, the only way you could do that was through a kind of integrated service that had a whole variety of options, you know, the, the app could say, well, you'll save $5 if you take a train and a bus to get there. 
uh, and it'll only take you, you know, 10 minutes longer, it'll only take you five minutes longer. And that way you can create these gentle nudges and, and encourage people towards different kinds of, of transport, ways that strengthen existing public transport infrastructure and reduce the demand for customers that are, are, are traveling just one person in, in, in one car. Because Uber has been terrible for, for the environment in many of the major cities. It's, it's hugely increased the amount of car traffic on roads. And um, uh, an organization like Ride London um, could integrate this service in. It could pay the drivers properly. It could get rid of this you know, algorithmic management. It could allow workers to have a kind of decent autonomy over their working conditions um, and greater participatory rights for users of the platform in different ways in which the platform could be could be governed and run. I think this more participatory element is really an, a very important aspect of it as well. So let's get to social media. Now, I also interfered to say you have around two, three, four more minutes, maybe. Uh, oh, that's good. I'll be yeah. over in two, three, four minutes. My dictatorial permit. I, now, I fully agree with a lot of what Jack is saying here. He says, in principle, I don't believe anyone should own or run Twitter. Well, this is a good start. I think he's on saying he's a smart man, Jack. It wants to be a public good at a protocol level, not a company. Again, yes, we're fully in solving, solving for the problem of it being a company, however. Um, Elon is the singular solution I trust. I trust his mission to extend the light of consciousness. Now this, I don't know, this kind of speaks for itself. This here's the light of consciousness. The man who said that he could solve world hunger for six billion dollars, but then decided to spend seven times that buying Twitter instead. Um, so, what would be an alternative to Elon Musk um, extending the light of consciousness through um, his singular vision for Twitter? Well, there are actually a variety of models of distributed social networking that that currently exist. Um, and they, you know, they go on what Jack was talking about, having these open protocols, right? Think of how we send emails to each other. You don't all have to be part of the same email platform. There's code and there's, um, there's open protocols that allow people to have interoperable services. I can send you an email because we, you know, different platforms use the same software and the same ways of communicating with each other. Um, there are examples that would enable us to have messaging services, to have communication platforms um, that were interoperable in this way, and that might be more decentralized. Okay, so when we think of how um, you know the such a, a, a series of platforms could be organized, we might imagine it in a much more similar way as like a, a sub community of Reddit, right, where different groups have more autonomy to set their own rules, to set their own moderation policies, um, and that you can have more private discussions while still allowing people to communicate with each other um, across them in a kind of federal model. So, what could that look like in practice? Well, we have things like. Um, Mastodon, for example, a lot of people have been talking about Mastodon today. Um, I think the server even crashed, right? Because too many people went onto it. Um, but Mastodon is like a Twitter clone, basically. Um, uh, and it's an example of a type of software that's available in the Fediverse, the federated servers, which, you know, have integrate different platforms for, for publishing and communication. Um, and they can kind of talk to each other. Um, but they face some problems, right? So content moderation becomes a huge problem, right? Because if you have smaller communities that are in charge, um, content moderation can be a huge burden. It can raise really difficult political questions um, uh, and it can drain resources of groups, basically. A second problem is a lot of these things don't look very good. They don't have a great user experience because they're not well-funded. So we would need ways to have public funding for them or ways in which they could compete against their much better funded alternatives. Um, a third problem is that when they are interoperable, this really slows down the way in which you can change features because everything still has to talk to each other. And an example I gave is that Signal, the, the messaging app, actually isn't interoperable for precisely this reason. They didn't think they could make it good enough and, and have the same innovation on the platform if they made it part of the Fediverse. Um, so these platforms still would need to find ways to migrate groups of people from the dominant corporate platforms. This is a huge question, uh, but I think we'll get to that in the questions and discussion. So I'm going to leave it there so we can have a bit more chat about it after. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you for the very interesting presentation that extended the light of consciousness. Um, I will uh, 
post some questions. Actually, I will try to also integrate the questions from the audience because I think they're very much straight on point and I was also thinking along these lines. Uh, my first question is, in, in your book, you outlined this very interesting strategy of combining resistance, which is like both epistemic resistance and workers' movements, then regulation at the state level and recoding. Um, and I, I think this is a fantastic uh, proposal and this idea to progress on all three fronts is very, very good. But I guess one of my main questions is uh, something that you also raised as a topic as a reason. Uh, you talk about the elite capture, uh, basically, of institutions, I would also say of ideology, we know the tech companies are spending a lot of money lobbying, convincing politicians that they're indispensable in the way they are. And beyond this, I think the ideological capture of people genuinely thinking that Elon Musk is a genius entrepreneur, everyone who has had party conversations about this can confirm this is very prominent. How can we challenge this? So what are the types of actors that you see progressing the alternative visions that you're suggesting? In the book, you talk about social movements. Um, I was wondering what is the role of political parties and here I also want to ask uh, another question that was raised in the questions and answers by uh, anonymous attendee, which is, is it useful to label this socialism strategically speaking, so do we want to come up with these alternatives as this kind of broad solution that will satisfy everyone. Uh, or do we explicitly want, for example, left-wing parties to take this up? What is the better strategy to actually make these proposals possible and to, to fight against both the elite and ideological capture? So that's the first question I want to pose, combining myself and the anonymous attendee, and then we'll move on. Well, it's really, really interesting and really important question. I think, you know, as you point out in the book, I do try and have my cake and eat it too by saying that we, we need a combination of bottom up bottom-up forms of resistance, things like unionizing, workers um, standing up to their company more. We need regulations that are going to erode the power of big tech companies. And we also need to create these alternatives. Now, you raise the question of political parties. Um, I think in order to enact legislation, we obviously need people and activists within parties to, to be putting, you know, innovative, uh, transformative proposals in the, the manifestos of political parties. I think we saw some fantastic proposals in the British Labour Party in 2017 and 2019, things like full fibre broadband for everyone that would be rolled out by 2030. Um, there was some interesting stuff around workers' cooperatives. Um, and so I think these kinds of uh, aspects do need to get onto the agenda of political parties, right? I don't see political parties as really necessarily at the forefront. Um, I think, you know, it's just by the nature of how, how politics works, it's much easier for, for civil society groups to raise more radical demands. I definitely see that as the kind of cutting edge. So people who are kind of like former tech workers and software developers, um, people who are re really engaged on this at, at a kind of daily level. Um, I think that's where most of the interesting stuff comes out and then kind of trickles over to, to political parties. But obviously when it comes to like getting into power, getting new laws, um, getting the funding for this kind of, you know, development to happen has to be through, you know, city and national government. So I think political parties play a vital role in that. I don't want to go back to the kind of movement only extra parliamentary politics that existed before the kind of Sanders Corbyn era. I think that that was a, a long dead end. Um, the second, the second part of your question was around strategic uh, basically danger oh why did i call it platform socialism yeah i see your point i point taken um look socialism is not everyone's cup of tea right but when when i i think at the end of the day when you think about it when you think about things like social ownership community ownership that's what socialism is and so much like a lot of the debates around feminism and this constant need of like, oh, why, why don't we not say we're feminists? Because that offends some people. We'll just say we're for equality. I think at the end of the day, you just have to name it what it is. It's we're for community control. We're for greater democracy um, over how the platform operates. I see your point that it's like not, it it's doesn't have a, a, as broader appeal perhaps as, as, as another label or another name. Um, but I think in the end, I, I went with it because it's, it is what I was describing. And, the, and I think it's just, it would be silly to try and pretend like it was something else. Thank you. Yes, I would quote Eric Meyer here, who writes in the chat, give it a million names, make it all the same substantially. <laughs> but 
I so I am convinced, but I think this is indeed a, a valid question. There was another question in the thread that I want to to raise uh, by I think it's Stephen. Uh, by, La by Laura James, or Laura James, uh, sorry if I mispronounce you. So um, Laura notes that there are already quite a few existing alternatives, but the problem is that they can't scale. So what concrete suggestions do you make in order to help these proposals scale or to think of projects that can scale? I, I know you mentioned some of the things in the book, and maybe it's nice to, to discuss this very briefly. So scaling, I think it, it has to be public funding, right? I think it, it has to be the, the only way that the, some of these um, small current prototypes will scale beyond a kind of local community or city level is if organisations like the EU, for example, or like national governments invest serious money into digital technology that isn't corporate controlled, particularly by like American or, or Chinese tech companies. Um, and without that money, I think it would be very, very tricky for anyone uh, to out-compete Uber or, or other tech companies in a, in a capitalist environment. Because I think Rosa Luxemburg, you know, called it a hundred years ago. Uh, you can't, it's very tricky for, for a, a, a cooperative to compete against a capitalist competitor in a capitalist marketplace. Um, and it makes the problem of transition to cooperative forms of, of economic production very difficult, right? Because uh, the, the model that I have really tried to adopt is, is that of Eric Olin Wright, who's this uh, Marxist sociologist. Uh, I think Yuli even mentioned like the word utopia and real utopia a, a bit. I think he kind of has it more or less right that you basically need to eke out and, and gradually expand a cooperative sphere of production so that you're growing institutions, you're building networks, you're getting power, you're getting more people, you know, on, on public media, you're growing institutions, you're growing think tanks, you're growing sectors of the economy, you know, you might be at 5% of production, then you're at 10, then you're at 20. I think that kind of a model of like eroding and transforming capitalism is one of the only viable paths. And I think that path must ultimately lead through parliamentary elections at some point. Um, and there will be a, a kind of a moment where there's a, a kind of a break, um, a, a switching over, but that scaling, you know, at in the beginning, it has to really just be public money because I don't think the, I think the profit motive is fundamentally corrosive of attempts to do things in the public interest because the, the, the interests of the company will always override that despite the ideology and really even sometimes it, alongside this ideology, right? Because some, some, most tech people think they're saving the world. Most of these CEOs and billionaires think that they genuinely uh, you know, solving problems and there for the benefit of humanity, because that's just, I don't know, it just seems to be the nature of, of rich people and oligarchs that there's just, you just delude yourself and you, you so many people believing your bullshit that you start to believe it as well. And I, I think that that's probably symptomatic throughout history of like oligarchs that feel that they, they have, they're, you know, making the right decisions for everyone else. Yeah. Megalomania. Um, two questions now we are going to uh, agree with you about the concept of democracy. So the first question is, and they will come progressively. So the first question is, how do you uh, basically engage with places that are not democratically uh, run and governed? So what is the future of democratic socialism in countries where there are authoritarian regimes um, and where people actually might find platforms such as Facebook or Twitter, even owned by Elon Musk? potentially more democratic than their own governments. This was one of the questions we had by the hosts and panelists. So someone from our team, I have my suspicion. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I get this question every time because it's such a good one, right? It's such an important um, question. I, th my only answer is that we have to struggle for greater forms of democracy, both online and offline. There's no other route to uh, democratic reform. And, and I guess part of this project is really about how do you spread democracy from a narrow political sphere to greater sectors of society? How can we have universities that run democratically? How can we have more of our life where public and accountable forms of power are operating rather than private power where a single person or a small group of people can make arbitrary decisions that affect everyone else? So how do we, how do we have more people take part in decision-making? 
it's a very tricky question, right? Because in some of these, uh, I mean, even in the UK today, right, it's a very fragile form of democracy and form of, um, you know, faltering more and more and eroding more and more every day. Um, look, I don't think there's there's any like silver bullet to, I, you can't, like, obviously there isn't a silver bullet to this. Um, I think when you when it comes to digital platforms, I think you can you can create forms of democratic governance on the platform, regardless of what kind of country you're in. But that's always going to come up against hard barriers, right? You're always going to have like people attempting to to switch off platforms, to ban them, uh, to ban certain features of them. Um, and so I think the only answer is really to struggle for greater forms of democracy within these authoritarian and semi-authoritarian regimes at the same time as we we struggle for greater democratic control over these online platforms which in themselves uh are kind of as we see as we've seen with with twitter have these very oligarchic structures within them just just much like the authoritarian governments we just probably don't hate musk as much as we hate putin for example yes thank you um Actually, this brings me to a more substantial question. I think it was also posed, posed by one of our anonymous attendees. Um, what you mentioned reminds me of this idea. I think I wrote to you in an email also in advance about not being able to have socialism in one country only. So platform socialism only is not enough. But the question that anonymous attendee poses is, I think, a very fundamental one. And it's a question I also struggle often. How can we be sure that democracy will work? Aren't we uh, kind of solving everything easily in, by saying we just need more democracy, considering the fact, the fact that we have a lot of disinformation, a lot of um, uncertainties, polarization, conflict. Why are we so certain that democracy is the answer? And my own project is on democratizing digital sovereignty. And this is something that I have been struggling with. So if we go deeper and probe this, why do we think this will be a better way to manage or govern any platform than what mm. we currently have, which is this kind of market-driven, profit-oriented, megalomaniac driven as well way but maybe maybe it could be worse actually if we go to democracy so this yeah it's a really good question um it's certainly not going to solve everything right so it's I, I i'm not suggesting and and i don't suggest in the book that that social ownership and, and democratic governance over platforms is going to eradicate all the issues that we have there right um what i do think is that it will go a significant way in in, in helping tame some of the most vagrant, sorry, some of the, some of the, the largest problems that we have. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, because of the profit motive and because of the need for constant growth and constant engagement, um, social media companies are, are kind of structurally forced to push the most uh, engaging content, right? And, and that has been shown to, to create greater polarization um, it's not in their interest to, to, to do things like hire hundreds and hundreds of moderators to provide proper moderation of their service, right? This is why it's a concentration of profits and an externalization of risk and responsibility. If they just want to make money and it's run as a for-profit service, they care about user numbers, they care about how many hours you use the platform, and they care about keeping their costs down. Um, and so there, there are so many issues around misinformation, around harmful content on platforms, um, around social media um, addiction, addiction, about how teens and children are, are treated and are uses of social media. So much of this would, would, would be reduced and would be um, dealt with if it was a public service that had a degree of accountability for it, that had a charter for looking out for the public in the same way that other public services that we know um, do. Now, this isn't going to solve everything, right? You look at the BBC. It's not like a bastion of, um, of, of you know, socialist utopia by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it would, it would be a, make a big difference, right? And it would also give communities greater degree of control for how to act back on that service. It creates a mechanism for a countervailing power uh, to develop and for people and communities and activists to constantly be able to have their voices heard and, and be able to say something. I think the problem is like, you know, when Musk announced that he was going to buy Twitter, so many people were just resigned to it. It was just like, oh, well, you know, why are you complaining? Who cares? Like, and it's like, this is like 
potentially the the beginning of the end for our democracy right like who knows what will happen i'm not saying it would definitely be a terrible thing but like it's not it's a very worrying sign that that i mean you know one of our main digital town squares is now owned by a, a verified maniac um so yeah I must say I am quitting Twitter, currently downloading my data and going on Mastodon, which indeed crashed. Last question and then uh, closing remarks. There are many interesting questions from the audience and I would encourage uh, people just to write James, write to James. But my last question is how can we popularize these ideas? It's a very practical one. Uh, there are fascinating movements, as you mentioned, in Spain, Latin American thinkers and movements that are very active on this. So how can we talk with these movements, how can this book make a wider resonance? And I think as organizers of this event, we are clearly trying to amplify these ideas. But what more could be done? And how do you see basically your um, book making also very concrete positive impact? Uh, and then I give the floor to Jeremy to close. The okay. Um, Big question. Well, I'm, I'm trying my best, right? <laughs> I'll so one of the I'll talk to groups, individuals, big or small, if people email me, I'm 99% of the time, uh, unless they're a maniac, I will get back to you, even if you're not one of the, you know, the big, big kahunas in, in like, I'll, I'll talk to anyone, happy to come to your reading group, happy to chat to, to you or your friends. Um, I'm trying to get the book translated, you know, and, and, you know, talk to other people. Uh, a lot of my contacts are in Germany though. So my, <laughs> my main reaching out at the moment is there, but I'm willing to spread my networks uh, further, but I, it's not just about the book, right? I think it, there, I think the important thing is there are lots of really interesting people writing and doing work in this space. So rather than thinking about platform socialism, obviously I'd like you to buy the book and, and engage with the work. I think it's also really important to engage with um, all of the different centers and, and think tanks and scholars and activists that, that are doing work, thinking about how we can have more ethical platforms, more community control, um, and, and I, yeah, I just really just want to like add a, a, a small contribution to, to the debate, particularly drawing on this like history of socialism stuff that I do, the kind of early 20th century workers movements. I didn't really talk about it because I wanted to give the most accessible side forward, but there is some interesting socialist theory stuff in there as well for, for those who are interested in it. Perfect. Thank you. And Jeremy, uh, I give the floor to you to maybe uh, close the event and give us a bit more information about your project. Thank you, Yuli, and thank you, James, for such a wonderful conversation. Um, it's been fascinating. We will have the recording available online in the next couple of days. So um, for those of you that know other people that can make it or would like to relive the talk, please um, do catch that. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of information about a couple of events we've got coming up. Um, we're thrilled to announce that on May the 20th, we're going to be hosting Francis Hagen, the Facebook whistleblower here in Cambridge. Um, events of that went live today, so please do check out our Twitter account and our website address, which I have popped in the chat. Um, before that, we've got a couple of other events. We're going to be hosting Azim Azar, um, who wrote his book Exponential, on which we'll be discussing on May the 10th. That will be both online and in person, um, for those of you in Cambridge or available online. And then on May 17th, we'll be hosting uh, Lisa Parks, who will discuss uh, media infrastructures and the relationship with globalization. And that will be an online only event. So um, we hope you can all join us for that. Um, and all of our events are usually at the same time, which is five o'clock um, in the evening, British summertime. Um, and we hope you can join us. So thank you again to James uh, and Yuli for your time and um, for all of you for joining us at home. And we look forward to seeing you at another event soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. See you on thank Mastodon. You. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.